Hello. Hi, I'm Sarah Cottingham. Um, we're going to, Catherine and I are going to take you through the first couple of bits of the deliberate practice session today. And then Harry's going to join us and talk about um, his bit. We, Catherine and I both agreed that we wanted to talk for hours about deliberate practice, but uh, we don't have hours. So we've kind of tried to narrow it down a little bit. Um, so I'm going to be talking kind of generally about person knows they need to make a change but there's a gap between them knowing they need to do it and actually making the change that's what we call the knowing doing gap so have a think for a second about something that you have tried to change maybe a, a new year's resolution example did you do it did you stick to it if you did you would be in the minority most people uh, their New Year's resolution fails within about a month. Um, so if you did stick to it, well done. But yeah, you'd definitely be in the minority. So why is that? Why do we find it so hard to change? The reason is, or one of the reasons, is that most of what we do is habitual. So most of the time we are um, acting on autopilot. We're doing things unconsciously. We're not really having to think. We eat the same thing for breakfast. We drive the same way to work. And this is good. This actually conserves a lot of energy. We don't have to think about things. But the flip side of that is when we do want to change, it's really, really hard. So we end up with this knowing, doing gap. How does that relate to teaching? Well, think about your teaching practice. You probably have gotten to a point where you're pretty comfortable in your teaching. Things are working, everything's going okay, but perhaps you feel that you're not pushing forward and continually getting better. But doesn't professional development help us with that? Doesn't all the professional development we're given at school, doesn't that move our practice forward? Well, this would suggest not. Most CPD actually suffers from the same problem. It doesn't get us over that knowing doing gap. It doesn't change teacher practice. That's such a stubborn thing going on with our habits that we can't change our practice. But you've come here today to learn something. You haven't come here today to be depressed about how you can't change. So take, I'm gonna give you 20 seconds now. You've all got a pad of paper and a pen. I want you to write down something that you want to change in your teaching practice. If you're not a teacher, then something you wanna change in your day-to-day -day practice. You don't have to be super specific. I'm gonna give you 20 seconds now, I'm gonna shut up so you can write down something that you want to change.
Okay, hopefully you've written down something. I can think of many things that I uh, I need to need to change and struggle to do so. Um, let's have a think about how you can do that. Well, you can use something called deliberate practice. What is deliberate practice? So as you can see from the slide, deliberate practice is used in pro performance professions like chess, like sport, like music. Teaching is also considered a performance profession. So what is deliberate practice? Let's contrast it to something called naive practice. That's something we're all gonna be familiar with. Imagine you've taken up tennis and you, um, you rock up every week to play tennis with your friend. And um, when you first start, you're not very good. You can barely get the ball over the net. Um, over, over the course of, sort of weeks and months, you get better. The ball is going over the net. Sometimes the ball even goes in the right place on the court. Your serve is maybe getting a bit better. Um, you seem to be doing okay, but you kind of plateau and you're okay with that because that's how you want to play tennis. But that's not what expert performers Expert performers push themselves out of their comfort zones. They have coaches that hone, on, hone in on a bit of their practice, give them incremental feedback and push them to get better. So they practice a little bit every time and they push themselves forward. That's what's called deliberate practice. You might be wondering, don't experts just get better by the amount of practice they do? You might have heard of something called the 10,000 hour rule. That comes from a book um, by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers. It's the idea that all it takes to be a, an expert is to put in 10,000 hours of practice. Well, it turns out that's not true. It's actually the quality of practice that matters. So quantity is important. Experts put in a lot of time, but they practice better. They practice better than non-experts. They use this thing called deliberate practice. You might also be wondering, you're thinking, isn't talent what's involved? Isn't it about genetics? Aren't some people just born with the capacity to become an expert and other people aren't? Basically, what we're asking there is, is expertise to do with nature or nurture? If it's to do with nature, well, then it's about your genes, it's about this innate talent, and it feels very fixed. Or is it about nurture? Can we use the environment and deliberate practice to get better and better and actually become an expert that way? Well, you'd probably be unsurprised to realize that the answer is it's actually both. So there's a bit of genes and there's a bit of um, environment and they interact and it's probably both. But I don't think we should worry too much about nature. So if you think about basketball, for example, I'm five foot four. I'm probably never going to be a professional basketball player. Genes really do matter sometimes. But in teaching, we don't really know what traits make a great teacher. They're governed by thousands of different incremental bits of genes. Why not focus on what we can focus on? Which is the nurture element. And deliberate practice offers us a way to get better and better. So let me introduce you to the man himself, that's Anders Ericsson, who's written this book called Peak. And Anders Ericsson coined the phrase deliberate practice. And he's written lots of, um, he's done lots of studies and written lots of articles. He sadly passed away quite recently. Um, and he is reacting against this idea that all there is to expertise is talent. He believes that deliberate practice offers a way for people to become experts, and that's what experts use. I'm gonna give you a second just to read through the slide. So in the next part of the session, Catherine's gonna to talk to us about the difference between purposeful practice and deliberate practice. But at the moment, just hold in your mind that deliberate practice is not naive practice. It's not just showing up and doing the same thing over and over again. It's 
really getting focused feedback from a coach, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone and moving forward. So let's have a quick summary. And there is no such thing as a, a perfect solution to a problem. Anyone who tells you that deliberate practice will, will work anywhere is, is probably not correct. So we must, we've got to realize the kind of caveats to deliberate practice if we are to kind of be really, um, be really like sensible consumers of the research. So deliberate practice is not a silver bullet. If you practice the wrong stuff, you won't get any better at teaching. How, what do we mean by the wrong stuff? Well, we, we mean things that um, perhaps are, are not supported or are contradicted by the evidence or are perhaps not best practice. So what do we mean by the right stuff? Well, expert informal knowledge, so having a coach who's really a, an expert teacher, for example, or, um, or looking at the research and using some of um, the best bets from research can help us. The second caveat is that, yeah, there is a criticism of deliberate practice. Um, Anders Ericsson has been told by, by many people that he's overhyped how much practice can help you develop. But even the people who say he's overhyped it and that genes play a role, they still admit that practice also uh, plays a substantial role. I think caveat number three is the most important and probably like the one that I'd love to, I'd love to change this. Um, we need more research on deliberate practice in teaching. So if we're to be really confident that it's going to help teachers, we need more robust research that it really helps teachers improve. Um, so right now I'm going to hand us over to the wonderful Catherine, who's going to take us through the principles of uh, deliberate practice. Thanks so much, Sarah. I, uh, it's really great to sort of pick up the baton from you, um, who is such an expert in this field. And Sarah is doing a fantastic, fantastically exciting master's at the moment in neuroscience. So we have the most fabulous conversations and she absolutely underplays her intelligence. She's uh, a really, really uh, deep thinker when it comes to deliberate practice in particular. And I've learned a lot from working with her at Ambition Institute and also the conversations that we've had um, over the last couple of months about deliberate practice. So folks, um, Sarah set the scene, she's given you some insights into the research, why we think, can I say we as a sector, not necessarily me from the Teacher Development Trust or Sarah from Ambition, but we as a collective feel that deliberate practice is something that's been really overlooked um, and there is a, a huge need for for us to consider how much space and opportunity we're giving teachers and leaders. I really want to stress that deliberate practice is also equally important for leaders. And we're trying to think about what that might look like at the moment. Um, it's absolutely integral to us, keep, to us improving and keep getting better. And I'm not currently in the classroom, more's the pity, and I'm not currently a school leader. And I am at the moment working in teacher education. And so I facilitate quite a lot of uh, professional learning and development. So for me, my deliberate practice at the moment is focusing on, believe it or not, trying to get better at presenting. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna talk to you about some of the things at the, the end of my session um, that I'm trying to do to get better at that. So I think, I think the massive caveat here is that Sarah's right. We do need lots more research into what this actually looks like in the classroom. But for now, we know that practice as opposed to no practice and deliberate practice as opposed to just sort of naive practice, ad hoc practice is definitely somewhere that we should be placing our bets. So with that in mind, I'm just going to take back control, hopefully. Uh, there with me. That was seamless. I clearly haven't been deliberately practicing that. Um, okay, so what does this mean for teachers then? So in this next session, uh, I'm going to take you through some of the uh, core principles of deliberate practice and try and unpack what this might look like for you.
I think at the moment we are really fortunate that we've got lots of schools, particularly free schools, uh, who are really sort of championing deliberate practice and in particular instructional coaching. And there's some fantastic practice happening and schools can go and visit. I was fortunate to a presentation from Reach Feltham recently as part of the uh, exemplary leadership program truly fascinating listening to their culture of instructional coaching but what do you do if you haven't got a culture of instructional coaching in your school well fear not some of the things that we're going to take you through this Steve, are designed for you to reflect on what could I do if we don't necessarily have that instructional coaching yet so this is really about empowerment and autonomy and for you to think about your own practice be that being a classroom teacher a middle leader a senior leader what are some of the things that you can do to improve your expertise in that particular domain so what do we know about expertise well, we know that novice teachers in comparison to expert teachers are going to be much more reliant upon rules. And if you think back to your own NQT year, and I know mine was very, very uh, like this, I was really trying to follow the policy to, to the nth letter, you know? So whatever was given to me, I'd be the first to complete it. I was really looking for my mentor, looking to my mentor for support. And as a, as a novice, you're really reliant upon that additional material, support material that you get from your school. Experts, however, are able to rely much more on intuition. And really that's where we want to get to. As teachers in the classroom, dealing with hundreds of different theories of action. If you're a secondary teacher and you're moving around, you're teaching your specific subject domain to lots of different students. You're dealing with lots of different theories of action from the students every single day. And you need to be responsive to that and use your intuition. And it's a challenge. And it's the same for school leaders as well. We also know novices consider everything. So when we're trying to make a decision as a novice, it can feel overwhelming. We've all been there. And an expert, on the other hand, is able to identify really clear patterns and make connections between those patterns, which then makes it appear to be so much more effortless. I know in my NQT year, as part of my induction programme, I was going to observe um, other teachers to see them teach. I didn't really have a clue what I was looking for. And I also thought, oh, my goodness, they make it look easy. I really can't do this. OK, so we really need to have much more of an understanding and awareness of those differences between novices and experts when we're looking at making connections and in particular patterns. So if we're teaching a student and they've got a specific difficulty, ah, OK, I remember this student that I taught a couple of years ago and they had a similar problem. And what did I do then? And you start to make these connections. Mental models, incredibly important, okay? So these are basically the way that we view the world. And in particular, mental models in the classroom for teachers help us to make better decisions. We've got really rich bodies of knowledge as an expert, interconnected knowledge, and we can make those decisions much more proficiently without even thinking about it. We've got a high level of automaticity and we've got a really rich repertoire of, of models to be able to draw upon to help us make decisions decisions when faced with a variety of problems because essentially teaching leadership we're problem solving tacit knowledge okay so for novices they need that really explicit knowledge exactly uh, what exactly is it that I'm developing and working on whereas for an expert they're able to draw upon a really rich bank of tacit knowledge that has built up from experience and then I think this is really, really interesting. And I had a debate actually with uh, Helena Moore, who is also an, a colleague of, uh, an ex-colleague of mine at Ambition Institute about what do we actually mean by informal and formal learning? So Helena was sort of saying to me, I'm not sure I agree with this one. And we then started to unpack, well, what does this mean? And I listened to some more of Anders Ericsson's interviews. So there's lots and lots of them on YouTube. You can also listen to his podcast, but there's also lecture notes. And if you're a geek like me, there's such a wealth of information out there. And he talks about that experts are able to draw upon informal knowledge without necessarily making that decision to embark on uh, a formal program or developmental program. They're seeking out this knowledge all the time and building up that repertoire for them to be able to make better decisions in the future. Okay, that is super brief, super high level insight into some of the differences between novices and experts and everything in between. So what has traditionally initial teacher education looked like? Well, 
anything like many of us have experienced, it could have been reliant upon the teacher standards. So when I was an NQT, the teacher standards hadn't been created yet, but I know when I was then a middle leader and a senior leader, the teacher standards were definitely a key player in terms of supporting any of the NQTs in the schools that I worked at with improving and doing what and developing their practice. But I think Carrie's quote here on the right hand side is really powerful because many of us will have had really good intentions and we will have wanted to have worked with early career teachers to help them develop, but it kind of it might have been really ad hoc and we're Frankensteining together teaching practice as opposed to being really clear and specific in granular detail, a key aspect of our practice that we want to improve. So there will be many people with the very best of intentions that will have ended up then creating this franking style approach to their teaching practice. And I've probably got that now, if I'm completely honest. I haven't been a class teacher for about three or four years. I was a teaching deputy head and I still taught when I was director um, at a professional learning across the trust, but certainly not enough. And I feel that when I after reading lots of research, working with lots of teachers and leaders, I definitely can see now how I've probably Frankensteined my practice together. And if I was to go back into the classroom, hands up, I think I might be a novice in quite a few areas. I think I will have built habits and experience that really needs to be unpacked and uh, pulled apart and deliberately practiced and improved. And I think that's something that as a sector, we need to be much more open to talking about because in change in year, change in school can fluctuate our expertise. And Pets McRae, another colleague, ex-colleague of mine, talks really clearly about that in memorable teaching and how some of these influences can really impact our teaching expertise. But all is not lost. We're in a really exciting period because we've got the early career framework. So just a really quick shot of the early career framework, focusing particularly on classroom practice. And you can see on the right hand side, it's not just about that knowledge, it's also about the how and really making sure that how is continually driven by practice, opportunity for people to acquire rich bodies of knowledge, talk to colleagues in their school, observe from other schools. We're really blessed now that we're Oak National, a great tool for us to be able to have a look at practice from other people and really then start to consider how practice is going to help us develop this expertise so that we can get to the point where we're able to make intuitive decisions in the classroom without perhaps being reliant upon rules and performer or employee. Into this, we've got the, uh, the recently published um, National Professional Qualifications. This is a really quick snapshot of the leading teaching qualification, which I'm particularly excited about. It builds on the excellent early career framework. And yet again, folks on the right hand side, a really clear golden thread of practice runs through our whole qualification. If we look at the National Professional Qualification for Leading Teacher Development, I do apologise that this is formatted in this way. Um, this is unfortunately due to the framework, it's not my poor design, um, and wink, wink. Um, but again, practice is really, really important here. So if you're leading the teacher development of this in your role at the moment, either as a middle leader or a senior leader, it's really, really important that we are developing our understanding of practice, in particular, looking at deliberate practice and how we can support people to keep making incremental improvements and develop their expertise. So as Sarah touched upon, there is a significant difference then between purposeful practice and deliberate practice. So if I could ask you to read this quote on the slide from Harry, please. So to hone in, I think that final sentence from Harry is really what I want you to hold on to here. When I was training as a teacher, I pushed myself and my trainers pushed me, but the direction was not always clear. And that's the difference then between purposeful practice and deliberate practice. OK, so. Let's now really quickly before Harry comes in with um, some input into how this helps us to make better decisions, just touch upon those five core principles of effective practice. These are some key texts that I would really encourage you to uh, access. 
Now we're going to unpick the first one, so the top left hand side, which is practice with purpose from Deans for Impact uh, back in 2015. But I'd also really encourage you to take a look at the old Institute of Teachings, Developing Professional Development for Teacher Change, uh, and then also Ambition Institute, Devel uh, Deliberate Practice in Teacher Education Handbook. If you haven't read Leverage Leadership, it's absolutely fantastic. We haven't got enough time to go into any significant detail. I'm just going to give a hat tip uh, towards the end when we look at feedback to the Paul Bambrick Santoyo's model that he uses in Leverage Leadership. The walkthroughs are there because they're actually a really powerful tool at the moment for us to help novice teachers make that comparison between what expert teaching looks like and what a really proficient model might look like, might being the operative word. So you've got the walkthroughs as that model, but then you need time to consider what's that going to look like in your context with your students, okay? And that's where you're able to use that as a really concrete model, but then play about with it in your own context. And then finally, another really fantastic book, Teach Like a Champion, Doug Lemoff's uh, fantastic work to help us really get granular on some specifics about our classroom practice, perhaps cold calling as an example, and so many more than that. Um, you know, it's a really rich body of knowledge that we can use, which is so much more specific than the original teacher standards that many of us have drawn upon to help us develop teacher practice in particularly teacher practice in early career teachers. Okay, so let's hone in then on the Dean's for Impact, uh, science of expertise, okay? So we're really starting to work expertise and how deliberate practice plays a key role here. So Ericsson's original research really, really tried to identify what was the difference between experts and novices. And he identified deliberate practice as being the key driver in determining how you develop expertise in a particular domain. Now, some of his criticisms are that he focused on music, sports, chess playing, and it can be argued that it's less easy to transfer into the domain of education. Nevertheless, it's worth trying folks. We know that practice will help us to improve. We know that purposeful practice can be too ad hoc and not specific. So why not give this a go and really see how you can be much more specific in the choices that you're making in terms of the areas that you want to improve. But what do you need to be able to do that? First of all, we need to push beyond our comfort zone. So we should be making choices about areas that we want to improve that are just above where we currently are in terms of our proficiency level, okay? We don't wanna switch people off and make them panic because it's too challenging, but we also don't want it to be easy because then we're in naive practice where we're just focusing on the same things over and over. And I think that's what Sarah really was focusing on in the first section. We want to then make sure we've got a really clear, specific goal that's going to make going to aid us in making incremental improvements. That focus is absolutely important. Focus here is stripping back all of that extraneous white noise that goes on in CPD programs. So we could be focusing on one thing, but our staff meeting timetable could have a whole range of other themes. It's really, really difficult for anybody to have to constantly task change and move, move around all of those different domains. Let's be really clear, if we're going to give people opportunity to deliber deliberately practice, let's try and strip as much back as we can so that they can really focus on that. We, we know that feedback is really important and that's why instructional coaching is often really aligned to um, deliberate practice. However, what do you do if you don't have a culture of instructional coaching? We'll unpick this a little bit in a moment. And then finally, mental models, okay? So these are the five key principles that help us or five key features of deliberate practice that we as teachers, as leaders, as schools, as groups of schools, multi-academy trusts, now the teaching school hubs really need to be focusing on and unpacking because as Sarah said, we don't have enough research, but let's not wait for really controlled uh, classroom environments and scientists to tell us how to do it. Let's have a go at experimenting in our own classrooms. Let's make sure that we're having conversations about how we're finding, uh, you know, experimenting to support each other to improve in their practice, to improve in our practice. Okay, so what do we mean by push beyond comfort zone? So there's lots and lots of different classroom challenges that we're faced with day in, day out. There are lots of different difficult uh, discrete skills that are very hard to master. We need to see development as a trajectory. We also need to expect failure. We're not gonna get this uh, straight away. It's, it's, it's a necessary part of developing our practice. We need to be able 
to create, we need to be aware of the types of culture where we can seek feedback from others without fear of judgment. That's really, really important. The problem there is for such a long time, our sector has been driven by high stakes accountability as opposed to development. The fact that we call um, it performance management as a performance development is even a change that needs to take place so that people see feedback from one another from their colleagues not as a not coming from a place of judgment but coming from a place of collective efficacy really seeing that actually what we do as individuals helps to improve the collective efficacy of the whole school and stretch yourself push yourself out of that comfort zone what might this look like then? So according to the Deans of Impact Journal, if we're working with novice teachers, we really want to make sure that there's clarity around, uh, you know, challenges that they're going to struggle with in their early career, okay, in their early teaching. And really recognise as well that those discrete skills are difficult to master. So talk about that. Talk about your own vulnerabilities. Consider some of the skills that still, even if you've got five or ten years of teaching, that you're still finding you curl your toes up sometimes because perhaps you don't particularly like teaching that concept or that particular subject area or primary. I can actually think of lots of examples where that still applied to me 15 years down the line, which is really very little time at all. See the opportunity to jointly create challenges as well and recognize that sometimes we might not necessarily push ourselves further far enough. We might push ourselves too far. And so having somebody in your school, they don't have to be a trained coach, but just somebody who's going to help you uh, with the process and talk it through with you is really, really important. When we're designing specific goals, then we're really making sure that we're focused on a very clear aspect. OK, and it's very important that it is a measurable goal. So we need to have a really clear understanding of our baseline, where we're starting from, really clear then incremental steps so we can make that comparison between um, what it currently looks like and where we want to get to okay really making sure that we then are able to track progress against these goals and this is where feedback is so important I've mentioned before about the the focus and the need to perhaps strip back some of the other things that can litter our CPD calendars throughout an academic year we also need to see development further than a single academic year and really look at two three years down the line people might move on absolutely that could happen and you know you we would encourage people to move on to other schools get lots of different rich experience but they might not and we need to give them the opportunity to see their development not from September to July but actually Actually, career development that spans two, three years um, at a time. Two mechanisms to identify, to intensify the focus then that we're looking at here is decomposition, so really isolating a specific element and approximation, so imitating a classroom situation. It's really, really um, useful when you are given classroom scenarios that you can start to explore and unpack. It doesn't always have to be that you are looking at uh, teaching live in the classroom. And again, you're then thinking about opportunities to focus on key aspects that teachers struggle with and making sure that opportunities are designed to focus on those specific elements. If we think back to the quotes that I showed you where Harry from his 2017 uh, Dean for Impact Journal was reflecting on his own teacher training. He was focusing on lots of different areas all at once and was therefore not necessarily making um, specific focus in a core area, which is what which is what Sarah was talking to us when she was making the comparison between naive practice and deliberate practice. So we know that feedback is incredibly important. I've spoken already about instructional coaching. So what do you do if you don't have instructional coaching in your school? Well, at the moment, as I've said to you, I'm spending a lot of time looking at clips of myself. So I'm recording uh, sessions that I'm delivering, playing them back. I'm absolutely cringing. I'm sure I'll do the same this evening. And I'm taking the time to try and unpack the choices that I've made live in the moment. I'm thinking about the language that I've used. I'm being frustrated that I wanted to use less words, but yet it still eludes me not to turn it into a monologue. But what I'm basically trying to emphasize to you is that no one's helping me do that, okay? So for you as a classroom teacher, you can perhaps film aspects of your lesson. You can also use audio clips, which is something that we did at, at a couple of schools that I worked at. So yes, we know that coaching is incredibly important and instructional coaching in particular is really powerful here. 
Yeah. But what I'm trying to emphasize is I don't want people to switch off from deliberate practice because you perhaps don't yet have that instructional coaching culture in your school. There's lots of other really rich materials out there, such as Oak Academy, that you can use to start to self reflect and make that comparison between your starting point, what you currently do, and the difference then that you're wanting to make, honing in on a very specific aspect of practice. When we are then able to work with another colleague in our school session, in our school setting, if you've perhaps got a colleague that's going to support you in, uh, with your teacher development, let's make sure that we've got that common language so that we understand the, the language that's being used when we're feeding back to one another, that concrete plans are being used to set dates for, for the next meeting so it's not ad hoc, so that everybody is really making sure that time is protected to have this feedback. We're not scrambling for feedback at the end of the day. Now, in some cases, timetables might not allow you to have that immediate feedback, so it might be worth considering other modes. So, for example, if you can't have it either in the lesson or straight after the lesson, how could you also use follow up emails to give people the headlines and then meet after school? I think what I'm trying to stress here is we might not always be able to have uh, we might not always be able to operate in an instructional coaching culture. But there could be other things that we could do to try and make sure that we raise the profile and opportunity for some really powerful feedback from our colleagues. And so then finally, the fifth principle then is developing a mental model of expertise. OK, so really making sure that there's a clear understanding of the science of learning and we're applying that to teacher education also and making sure that we're able to make that comparison between student performance and their mental model of student learning. This then means is really honing in on um, both the teachers that are working with you and you as yourself, having a really clear understanding, an agreed understanding of cognitive principles about how students learn. And then consider how self-monitoring and the role that that plays is integral to the process. So I think I touched upon this in the introduction, self-regulation and metacognition, we talk a lot about that in terms of students' own learning, but we rarely talk about it in terms of adult education. I think what's really, really helpful here is that we raise the pro profile of self-regulation and metacognition in teacher development or leadership development. So we're able to really reflect on our own learning processes and how we're developing our mental models as we're engaging in professional learning programs, but most importantly, as we're then deliberately practicing that knowledge and learning in our classroom or in our role as school leaders. And that comparison is really, really key. So very clearly, I can see that Harry's this, and I'm conscious that we need to move on to the next section. But what I really want to just quickly end on to then tee up to Harry's next section is we talk about mental models quite a lot. And it's really important that we understand why. If we focus purely on impact in the classroom, there are so many influences and other mitigating factors that impact that impact, I could do with finding another word there, but hopefully you understand what I'm trying to say. You know, there's, there's previous class teachers, um, there could be students, different starting points, home situation, all sorts of different things, okay? So it's really, really difficult to unpack that. If we then look at teachers' actions, that's also problematic because we know what they're doing. We don't necessarily know why, which is gonna segue into Harry's uh, session in a moment. So finally, the best bet really is to focus on developing really rich uh, bodies of knowledge and helping people to make that connection between knowledge so that we're developing those really rich mental models so that then our expertise is about using that connected um, knowledge to help us make better decisions in the classroom, reaching that automaticity and being much more intuitive in terms of the decisions that we're making, thinking less about the journey and thinking more about the how to get there. So. If we had more time, folks, I would have liked to have gone in much more detail. Very conscious that I need to now hand over the baton to the fabulous Harry Fletcher Wood. I'm just going to give Hi. you a Harry. Thanks, Catherine. Hi, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'm going to build on what Catherine and Sarah have talked about, but, but also reiterate uh, a couple of bits of it. And the third thing I'm clicking on this, is this what I want to be happening? There we go, uh, don't get too excited. Uh, it's quite weird controlling someone else's screen, but obviously I need uh, more practice. So I wanna start with um, one of my favorite anecdotes from one of my favorite books, uh, and it's Gary Klein, and he basically spent 20 
25 years looking at what he called naturalistic decision making. So how do experts operate under pressure? And he looked at fire officers and people in emergency services and military. And he has this account of um, the time that the um, fire crew turn up and the house is burning down and they go into the house and they start spraying water, water doesn't have a neck. And the person leading the, the fire crew has this instinct, pulls everyone out of the house um, about 10 seconds before the floor collapses. And Klein sits and interviews him and like, how did you know what was going on? And, and the, the guy's just like, I just knew, I just felt it. And it was only by sort of really digging in that they were able to multiple rounds of interviews. They were able to, to establish that um, there were a couple of telltale signs. So uh, there was more of a breeze than there should have been. Uh, and there was a different sound from a normal fire. And why I, I like this account because it epitomizes this idea of expertise, tacit knowledge. And this is the kind of thing that hopefully at stage we're working towards. So how the, the issue is the fire commander um, like didn't even recognize his own expertise. I think that's often the situation that we've come from. Don't recognize the expertise. It's then really hard to break it down and pass it on to others. Um, and so you get training experiences like this. So these are all real photos from my uh, experience as an initial teacher trainee. So on the left hand side, you can see we spent quite a lot of time like breaking down theories of learning, some, some of which weren't actually true, it later transpired, and kind of like teaching them to each other. We spent a chunk of time doing this thing in the middle. I should say the size of the photos is proportional to the time spent on different. We spent teaching each other, this is like boy, the, the sort of like things on, on the end of ropes as like examples of uh, how to teach. And then we spent a bit of time doing practice lessons. That's what's going on in the bottom right. But we just sort of hammed it up. It was really silly. We called it micro teaching. And all I learned from it was that teaching was really hard and I wasn't ready. And a great paper uh, a few years ago now from the new teacher project sum up the kind of training experience that I think is typical for, for many of us. I think one misinterpretation of, of deliberate practice is that we don't think teaching is cerebral and we're trying to create automata. And I think this is a really good counterpoint to it to say like, like we're never sure of being cerebral in teaching. Uh, we think about our practice a lot. We talk about it a lot. And often that's not the thing that we need more of. Um, and so to sort of turn this to concretize it, um, if you were in a training session about exit tickets and it were a sort of pretty good session, I think you'd see these three things. So like exit tickets are great. Here's why exit tickets are great. Here are some examples for you. And as a new teacher educator, that's the kind of session that I would lead. Um, and it, I'd say, I think my hunch is still a minority of teacher development sessions that you'd experience in any school on any given Wednesday. Um, you would then go on and say, okay, we're going to spend 20 minutes practicing writing exit tickets and not just everyone go away and write exit tickets in departments, but really honing sort of, okay, here's an exit ticket. Let's have some feedback. Let's write another better one. So by the end of the session, you're really confident and you can take the ingredients to get an exit ticket uh, and make sure that that's what you're able to create. So I got really into deliberate practice for a few years and like some stuff about it and got a really good challenge from Lorna Shires, who runs the initial teacher training program at Oxford Brooks. And she says, well, look, I can see why deliberate practice helps for um, uh, for, for my son, who is a bas loves basketball. And it's great for things you can drill so he can stand there and throw the ball through the hoop or whatever you do uh, as many times as it takes until he does that really well. But I don't think it helps you with analysis gameplay and decision making um and i thought it was a really good challenge and and struggled to answer it for a while and went back to well who who do we take this from who does a lot of deliberate practice and two questions that do the most of it are pilots and uh people in medicine um pilots like you don't get in a plane until you've done hundreds of hours of a, in a simulator medicine less so but becoming increasingly common you practice things that are difficult um and why do you do that well i think there are several things 
that practice can do that can help us not just like oh stand there which is important and actually having the right posture as a new teacher is something that you can struggle with um, but I think practice can help at higher levels as well so you can practice to get better at the judgments that you're making um so one way would just be to practice making judgments so if you imagine a teacher a newer teacher uh, early in their career um a student does something wrong you're under pressure all sorts of things going on and you make a snap decision and sometimes that's the wrong decision so you can practice making a decision you like is this should i sanction this child should i walk over there what's the next thing to do if a student has said such and such you can also practice in such a way that those judgments become automated that you form habits because that allows you then to sort of come up with the appropriate response under pressure and you can also practice practice allows you to review judgments so if i walk into your classroom and you've just given a child a sanction like i can't say fair and whether i didn't see what happened and even if we really sort of pulled it apart in a forensic way i still wouldn't know what's going through your head and their head at the time whereas we can practice a scenario and then deconstruct it decompose it and say well okay it's interesting that you chose that let's what would happen if you spoke in a different way what would happen if you tried this in a different way and um, so practice allows us to do all of these things differently or better and also practice just allows us to make space for judgment, because the more we practice, the more we automate some things, the more we can think about others. Um, and for those of you listening who've taught for more than a few years, there will have been a point where you were able to like give out papers or get kids in through the door and also think about, well, how does each child's face look? Or what do I need to do next in the lesson? And that I think is the most powerful thing practice can do by automating the less complicated stuff it provides us more brain space for more complicated stuff a lot of the examples i've given have been about uh, classroom management because that's where it pops up most often or most naturally but you can just as well use practice to learn to plan lessons um, and i think one of the awful ways that a lot of professions not just teaching prepare people to be competent in it is say just do loads of it not very well uh, and then eventually you'll, you'll pick it out. So, you know, you plan lessons every day for like three or four or five or 10 years, and eventually you become vaguely competent at it. It's like, well, actually, if you want people to become really competent at planning lessons, maybe you want to spend an hour just practicing creating great lesson objectives and great exit tickets to monitor whether those lesson objectives have um, have been fulfilled. And so I think like, okay, great, practice writing exit tickets, but then throw in, you can practice reviewing exit tickets, practice making the judgment for the next step. And I think once we do those things, we pull together what deliberate practice allows us to do about automation with what deliberate practice allows us to do about judgment making and help a professional both be more cerebral and more effective at putting their cerebralness into practice. And on that rush note, I will stop and I think hand over to I don't know if we're mod how we're moderating uh, questions and comments, but I will hand over to whoever's in charge of that. Do I need to hand back control, Catherine? Or can you do that yourself? Give up remote control. I'll sort that. Thanks, Harry. Um, am I giving this back to you? I think you can do, yes. Um, we'll have that control, uh, put the pressure back on. Um, thank you so much, um, Catherine, Sarah, Harry, um, for, for the talk there. So we, we have got 15 more minutes. I was just wondering whether anyone, um, the attendees, have any questions they want to pose um, or any, any of the panellists uh, want to ask any questions? Louis is. Is Always me. <laughs> um, wow, that was just so good. I've got. I've probably got so many more questions than I than I had answered there, but in a really, really good way. It was just phenomenal. So thank you to the three of you for that. Um, what I want to, well, I don't even. This is a question, or maybe anyway, I'll go for it. Um, so we've got our our teachers. They very much got their um, kind of theories of action, um, which if we want to to change their behaviour in the classroom there, there there's a, a lot of self-regulation that is involved in that and a lot of kind of self-awareness and self-reflection how do we then go from this pro 
the, the process itself is great, but getting them to see that need for the deliberate practice, um, I think is probably the, one of the, the biggest barriers to teacher development. I think particularly if you've got someone who has been teaching for quite a while, that need for change. Anyone of you can answer that or none of you? the question is how you get them to believe that deliberate practice is going to help so we'll assume for a second that they agree that like there's an issue with student motivation or whatever it is so they, mm -hmm. they want to get better at the thing so um my take and my experience has been that once people start to do it they buy into it quickly once they see themselves changing minute by minute so basically say whatever needs to be said talk about pilots talk about surgeons talk about your own practice talk about and as say whatever needs to be said to get them engaged in it initially initially give them a really small target a really short burst of practice and then follow up immediately with feedback to them onwards and see like oh i am being warmer in the way i engage with students or i'm being more confident whatever it is and once they've been going get then like they'll never look back thank you yeah, I'd just jump in there, Louise, and say I wonder sometimes if people are slightly put off or less motivated to engage with it because I'm and because just have so many things to do. It feels like another thing. And I think to reiterate Harry's point, you know, they need to recognise that actually this is going to help them enjoy their job and hopefully be better at it. Um, but because of so much other stuff that happens, people just see it as just another thing why the focus be stripped back so that people have got time to really engage with this yeah i think i think this just really highlights that necessity for development plans or cpd curriculum to be really really focused and giving you that opportunity to be really granular with it because otherwise this is possible at CPD programs of old when you're trying to change seven different things and make sure you've got literacy and numeracy in every single subject as well. Yeah, so thank you so much for that. Thank you, Lou. Um, we haven't got any questions that have been posed. There's lots of thanks. Um, so Robin says thank you, it's been great. Um, we've got a question, I've got a question, I've got a question. Um, so this is from Veronica. I'm interested in mental models with experienced but poor performing teachers. What do we know about undoing poor mental models and building better ones? That's a great question. And I, I really do think that would apply to me if I was to go back into the classroom at the moment, having had a gap in teaching and also not necessarily um, have had the most in, the best induction into teaching. I think my middle school was really fantastic. I was fortunate to have worked with um, a head teacher who were really interested in uh, expertise. She was uh, particularly interested in, um, in in sport and used to bring bring a lot of uh, insights from sport into her leadership styles. Some were good, some were not so great. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure I've got the answer to that question, but it's it's something that really interests me. How do we sort of undo, unpack a model that's been created is going to be really uh, drenched in bias. And we've got quite comfortable at, at using that. It feels like that comfy cardigan. So I don't know, Sarah, Harry, what are your thoughts on that? I'm going to give you a really oversimplified answer. I think we know loads about changing them because we're teachers. That's what we do with students. Um, but the thing that I particularly drag out is like actual models and then the explanation of them. So if you've got a teacher who struggles to time their questioning effectively, taking them to the classroom and the person who times their questioning best and sitting with them like, what do you know to get it down for them is probably a powerful thing. Yeah, I think I think your um, your guy Klein writes a bit about this about undoing um, mental models and and it's really hard and it's yeah it's, it's definitely a challenge. I think with the deliberate practice kind of stuff, I think um, it's like really important that sort of sits behind it. I think there's not a lot of stuff on it. It's like the culture of practice. So if we want them to change their practice and their experience, they've kind of got these habits that have 
that are stuck and they probably think they're doing all right with those habits so there's not much of a kind of impetus to change there so it about around the culture of change that you're creating around them as well and using that kind of social norm of everyone sort of doing this deliberate practice so I think we've got to invest in that and I think if we're going to advocate for deliberate practice we have to do it too so as uh, Catherine talked about with like leaders and stuff you can practice conversations like seeing difficult conversations really useful and important so I think we have to think about that that culture side um, and Dan Hudson um has uh, done some blogs on this on, on Twitter, Dan Hudson 86, I think he is. And um, he was on uh, the Becoming Educated podcast as well. But I think we need more on like to practice and how about that. We need to think about that, think about what's around this teacher and think about it is really difficult for them to change, put those models in as, um, as Harry said, and then hopefully we can start to see some, some traction. I think just to pick up on that then, um, from both Harry and Sarah, that's why Viviane Robinson really uh, champions the importance of conversation and particularly um, opening conversations. So instead of coming in with a new theory of action or a new theory of change, okay, we don't spend enough time engaging in the type of uh, conversations where we're able to understand people's theories of action. So their beliefs and values that are underpinning those decisions that they're making and, and their actions in the classroom. We almost sort of bypass them don't and we come in with this new thing that we want them to focus on and the reason being is that yet again we're so limited for time it's easier to just sort of uh, enforce it on someone than perhaps to take them with us and that's why you know practice in, in terms of leadership expertise is, is equally important but so this is reliant culture and so much is driven from uh, professional conversations. So it's a great question. I think for too long, we've observed other teachers teach, but without that narrative that sits next to it, where you're able to really unpick uh, the, the, the actions that you're seeing and consider the impact. Um, so yeah, lots of different things can focus on helping improve the aiming of models that perhaps aren't as proficient as they need to be. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Kat, you have your hand raised. Would you like to come in? Hello, um, I'm probably going to put Catherine on the spot, but it's her own fault because she's mentioned it twice now. But I just wondered, even if it's the infancy of your thoughts, what deliberate practice in leadership would look like? Well, it's not in the infancy of my thoughts. That's so good. I'm having conversations with uh, Helena Moore, um, and also Tom Reese. I know that Jen, Jen Barker is also thinking about this. I've spoken to quite people about what it looks like. So, so many people assume, oh, that's not a leadership thing, but actually there are, there are lots of um, aspects uh, to leadership that uh, practice would really um, improve us to, to maximize our influence. So we, we've almost got to pick what do we mean by leadership that's another conversation are we focusing on influence Kat I know you raised it last night at Ed Club certainly if Neil Gilbride was here he'd be really championing yeah it's the influence influencing others um, but I also really see it as you know the importance of management and responsibility okay so making sure the systems and processes are in place there's lots of practice involved in how we're having professional conversations so how we're chairing meetings for one, we just assume that people can chair meetings. I sit through lots of meetings that I literally want to stab myself in the eye with a spoon. And that's been in so many different organizations. And, um, you know, we have two meetings, and we don't have enough agendas and too much time is wasted. So meetings is definitely an area. I'd also argue that we need to practice being really proficient at strategic plans. Strategic plans, we're obsessed with boxes, okay? And we're obsessed with filling in these boxes and then the plans complete. When nine times out of 10, the plan then isn't driving what we're actually doing, what are the time? So let's just unpack and practice how we actually use a, a plan to help us uh, enact a strategy. Implementation, that's another area that really, really makes me want to, again, get the spoon out in my, in my eye. Um, because too, too quickly, we move through the, this is the problem, this is the solution, now let's all go. So in answer to the question, <laughs> there is an answer, Kat. I honestly think that if we took the same approach to teacher development and look at the early career framework, 
to school leadership and really consider uh, what are the bodies of knowledge that we need? How does that progress then as we develop our leadership expertise through middle leadership, senior leadership, et cetera? Then I think we're able to really identify some key concepts and big ideas that we don't practice and we just assume people could do. So that's where I'm at with my thinking. Thank you. If if I can chip in, I I'd be involved. Say like there's there's nothing that I wouldn't want leader to practice that they aren't meant to be good at. Um, so I lead a program for heads of professional development through Ambition Institute, and uh, whenever we do new stuff that's important, we practice it. Um, and that's partly so they get the experience of doing it and becoming better at it. That's partly from their practice is form of assessed for me because when they i see them doing it i see whether or not they understand it um uh, and, and now sometimes that practice might mean like writing a document and getting feedback on it. it doesn't mean we have to be just like standing up and role playing but yeah i think it's integral to anything that you want to do well and i think the examples catherine's given are like really examples of things that practice a lot just because we neglect practice because we neglect kind of the craft of running a good meeting as she says just assume people and we just try and copy business so we use we, the origins of leadership in the education sector come from business. And then all we try and do is copy. We don't really deeply unpack and understand it. And being is that some of the books are anecdotal. They're not theory based. There's no robust model for us to be able to actually refer to. So, you know, I really do champion domain specific leadership knowledge because the reason why we have such long meetings that perhaps could be done, you know, in an email or didn't need to happen at all. Or the, or the reason we have such strategic plans is because we haven't focused on the domain specific skills that are required for leading a school. On that note, do you think that the new national professional qualifications go some way to address that then? Because I think they, in the old work that it was saying intentioned I think but I'm not sure whether it was enacted particularly well and you could you could jump through the hoop without necessarily becoming better at that thing but you could definitely get a tick in the box yeah. um do you think the new framework addresses it so uh really great question I think that there are lots of really good intentions uh, around the national professional qualification. Why have they not done the job? People like to focus on the qualifications themselves, the, like not being good enough, the framework. I like think of it as if a school is sending a middle leader on a programme, that's a problem. So first and foremost, people accessing the MPQs, do they want to do it? Are they just doing it to jump through a hoop for career? Because that's a problem. Are they doing it, but the school's not really gonna support them? So they're not gonna have time. They're not gonna have the resource. They're not gonna have a coach to have feedback. So the school is going to encourage colleagues to access the national professional qualifications. The new frameworks are definitely a step in the right direction, but you need to have that joined up thinking in school. People need to see it as part of their developmental trajectory and not just jumping through a hoop for promotion. And I think that there's still a lot of work to do there. And we're also going to need to really align the ECF framework, the MPQs, the teaching school hubs, because we've got some really fantastic content, the best content that we've had in a very long time. But what's really now required is some, some, some very hard thinking around uh, how we implement that, because implementation remains the biggest barriers. Thank you. Um, Dave, so we've just got Dave's got his hand up. Do you want to come in? And then we've just got a question from Christina in the audience. And then I suppose we're going to jump over to Clubhouse and see if that works. <laughs> Dave, so I've got I've got a scenario. I'm going to try and keep this really really clear. I've jotted it down. So you've got a novice teacher, um, early into their career, um, context of the school not really got the culture, the framework for deliberate practice. Is there a limit to how many strategies, things you would recommend them to practice at any given time? So for example, they need to work on the question, they need to work on every aspect of teaching, 
but do you give them a certain number of strategies to focus on at any given time? Yeah, I'll come in here because I, I have thought of that. Um, yes, I think, yeah, definitely. Great. Could I, could, Sarah, sorry to interrupt. Could I, could I add something to that? Oh, yeah, what do you think the top, top three things are that the novice teacher should get really good at first? What, what should be the top three priorities? This is a, uh, it's a real question, and it's been thought about a lot, a lot, I think, in terms of like Sorry. sequencing professional development. Um, like, what do you sequence? So I guess if you take it back to mental models and you take it to the kind of needs of the classroom, like, what is it you think that you might need to do first with them? Uh, either their cope. So, sort of, my, my belief, and this is the kind of best bet of some kind of programs uh, the ambition early career program has kind of taken this bet is that behavior comes first so you can't really get much done unless you have behavior right Lee, behavior is not behavior like if you have really poor planning that can affect behavior as well but there are some things that you might do first around behavior um, and it depends what they're doing at the moment is it is it a presence issue are they not giving clear instructions, that kind of stuff. So I'd say that sort of stuff probably comes first because if you haven't, you can't control your class, you really do anything. Um, so I would say that 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 stuff would be first. But I think something Catherine and I were talking about before this, and Catherine used a really good word for that, like Frankenstein sort of training where you pick up lots of different things. If you think about mental models, we want like, can not rich mental or really well candid like harry's saying about expertise you're able to act like intuitively if you're an expert that's your really connected mental model so if you're jumping around and giving them a target on behavior and a target on assessment and a target on you know some planning or something like that they're never going to build that mental model so on a kind of long goal in mind but have like the small incremental goals for them to build up to that goal and then you probably want to give them one small thing to do in a week. And then you want to check if they've got it the next week when you go in. And if they haven't got it, you're going to need to remodel it and repeat it. Don't move on. Give them more than one. Bit. If they're struggling, their cognitive load, they're not going to be able to cope with more than one small thing. I like that answer. Wait. <laughs> right here. Um, thank you. So, um, which goes then, I suppose, to um, the final point. We're going to move across, I think, to Clubhouse. Is that right? I just, I, that just feels weird saying it, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, Lou, exactly. Yeah, this is it. Um, <laughs> there ain't no party like a Brewed Clee Clubhouse party. Gosh, that was a yeah. mouthful. <laughs> Um, just one, quick, one quick, I just want to get Christina's in because Christina's just said, yeah. is there an optimum ratio of time spent on delivering CPD versus practice? Or hmm. I, I get asked this quite often and I say a third, between a third and a half. Uh, I wouldn't separate, I'd say like this is part of your, I say a third to a half because I know it's like, getting the kids to do the writing in a lesson it's the thing you know like oh we're having a great discussion and then the 20 minutes writing you give them five minutes at the end um it sh should be the core and often if you think of the sort of the Doug Lemov idea of everybody writes like get to do some writing and discuss and do some more writing in the same way maybe just like five minute practice early on and then we'll talk about some more stuff and then we'll refine it um but yeah you know a third is that's sort of bullish that's that's like okay let's and get loads in but if you don't for that it ends up you always run out of time it never happens people don't get everyone gets a chance to go don't get a chance you can give feedback. harry thank you uh catherine sarah any final remarks from that or are we are we going to go to the clubhouse whatever that means how does it i'm side by this by the way oh, yeah. Yeah. I, Real perfect. Sorry, I'm going to oh, end on a controversial God. note, and I do apologise. I, lo I love controversies. This is, this is yeah. good. <laughs> I actually think it's problematic that we've got so much 
CPD stuff happening at the moment on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And saw a few things where I was like, okay, how have we identified for this session what the need is, what the key takeaways are going to be? I would, I love Kat Scutt's session that she did for the Teach Development Trust. We're all so limited on time. We're not now having any downtime. And I can be sitting on some of these things with the best of intent pension people delivering have the pensions i actually think downtime would be a better use of my time because i'm just taking such a scattergun and frankensteining together all of these great ideas when actually i just need to rest and think about what i've already been learning over the last term and a half where am i going next perhaps where do i need to check in who do i need to check in with school where else can i go as an external expertise but be very specific as opposed to this, this looks great. And, you know, there's a few few well-known edu Twitter names. Um, so something I'm going to be doing is less things because, you know, I think probably I've, I've been doing too much white noise and not honing my practice enough. So I think that's that part of what's trying to get at. There's so much of it out there. How how do, does a novice filter between what, what really matters and, and doesn't end up? getting themselves so and they're, they're, they're trying too much too quickly I think it's a problem I, I spent some time this looking at a well-known expensive provider who's doing a world conference over I think it's three or four days a phenomenal people experts in their field a really increasing amount of people who are doing the doing in school as well but I thought to myself wow there are four broad themes how you'd be sitting on there having so many different perspectives and views and things I, I think that we're definitely raising the profile of CPD but I think it's to the detriment of need and uh, formatively assessing how we're doing um, you know impact evaluation is super hard to do well but at the very least we can start to use formative inferences I don't know how doing that at the moment all of the stuff that's out there so if I had one wish it would be that we perhaps did a little bit less and the choices that we made were a little bit more um, intentional, mm. but you know, that could be me. <laughs> okay. Like okay. It. Cut the white not cut the Frankenstein. That's, that's, that's my, that's my generalization from that. Idea. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Bro. So should we, should we stop recording, start recording and then 